welcome to the Being Forces Friendly podcast, which is all about partnering with Defence. In this new season, we focus on personal stories of different members of the Armed Forces community to understand their unique experiences and hear more about their lives. Welcome to Being Forces Friendly podcast. My name is Ben Onions. I'm the National Account Manager at Defence Relationship Management. Today I have with me Mike Neville, who is an Army veteran, and he's got some really incredible stories for us today. He's also a manager at Net Company. Mike, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi Ben, good to see you again. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Mike Neville. I am in year seven now of a technology career, career 2.0 for me. And for 20 years before that, I was I was in the Army Air Corps. Great, thank you. So, um, what made you join the Army? Yeah, do, do you know what? I, you know, I was reflecting on this uh, on, on the way over today, and what made me join the Army was uh, a long time as a child looking at the Navy. And, and then that whole thing comes full circle, which we'll probably get to in our conversation today. My father was a submariner, 27 years, yeah. tremendous beard and a pipe, long introspective silences, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and we used to spend quite a lot of time on ships and submarines and things like that, my brother and I. Uh, which was really cool, really interesting. And back in the 70s and 80s, the Royal Navy used to have these massive days called Navy Days, big show-off days. Yeah. And there'd be big ships and all sorts of things would happen and Royal Marines and helicopters would fly. And, and probably as, as, as I've got older, my mind has embellished a memory from that, which was seeing a load of helicopters doing cool stuff and then seeing a Sea Harrier jet flying down Portsmouth Harbour, which felt like incredibly low, and, and this must be an embellishment, because I, as I remember it, it was inverted as it was going down Portsmouth Harbour. And I thought, there's something about military aviation, obviously I couldn't think like that then, but there's something about military aviation that kind of fascinates me, but I'm not so sure about the Navy. So, and, and, and you know, as I got older, um, I sort of figured that actually it's the army. Um, I went to boarding school in Scotland uh, when I was seven. Can you imagine going to boarding school in Scotland with this sound for your voice when you're seven? Uh, it was actually a really cool school, really nurturing. And we spent a lot of time outside, uh, either on a sports pitch or in the hills. And, and I kind of realised that teams and leading teams in, a, in that sort of environment, and that's a kind of foundational block of a lot of people that want to join the army. Not boarding school, but I mean sports and hills yeah. and all that. Um, and I kind of figured, yeah, actually, it's the army. But then I kept coming back to, it's actually aviation as well. And when I was a teenager, I started that, that, that journey. And that journey to, from going from, I'm interested in army aviation to becoming a qualified pilot is a very, very long, very long journey. It starts with a trip to, to the army air corps to see if they like you. Yeah. You then have to do your aptitude tests, which is kind of, you know, coordination and yeah. interpreting instruments, all that sort of stuff. That's a big filter, because that comes with a medical as well, air crew medical, big filter, lots of people can't get through that. Uh, then flying grading, which was, when I did it, it was three weeks in an aeroplane. And, uh, at the end of that, everybody can fly an aeroplane, but it's not about that. It's about how quickly you learn and how few mistakes you make. And then that, it puts you on a curve and and the interpretation of that is the person who's on the right side of that curve is probably going to pass the pilot's course when that happens. So they want consistency? Yeah. Is that what they're after? Learn quickly, don't make mistakes. So the stuff you learned yesterday, we are assuming you know it all today because we're going to throw a whole, a whole lot of new stuff at you today. So you know, you've got to keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. Yeah. Then Sandhurst, which is a yeah. year of all sorts of things, um, lifelong friends for, for one, yeah. uh, loads of outdoors, I was on the boxing team, I loved that, um, I mean, around the Santa's that are just a little bit much, there's a lot of marching, which, <laughs> which you know, I didn't join too much, um, but that's good, so you do that, and then you've got your pilot's course, and that was 18 months. So if I had all that together, if you did all that seamlessly, okay, that is a long time, and that's just to become a qualified pilot. So and that's two and a half years before you get to your unit, I guess. Yeah. If not holding patterns yeah. and, yeah, and all of other that. things. Yeah, yeah, all of that. And if you add, and I'll come to it probably later, but if you add also the Apache course to that, that's another 18 months. Really? So if you've got a person who, who now does yeah. all that, I mean, they're, what are they, three, four years of just 
determine it and you've got to back yeah. yourself because you're doing your driving test twice a day every day for, for years you know that's a that's a tough obviously um on the so we've done training now we're on to serving proper, proper you've gone to your unit what are your favorite serve stories from from serving anything that stands out anything particular yeah. i'm sure there's pl- plenty but i got posted to Wattisham after the pilot's course and, and honestly I had to look that up I, I didn't know where that was <laughs> <laughs> I was not familiar with Suffolk I, and I live there I still I've not never left and I was posted there as a gazelle pilot and I went to Cyprus Canada Northern Ireland Oman Malaysia all in my first 18 months what sort of years were these what, when did you uh, first so join posted uh, to Wattisham year 2000 okay yeah. uh, so this is this is you know, leading up to and and you know, two thousand to two thousand and three, all this sort of stuff happened. And one, of, I'm, I was remembering over the weekend, one of the really interesting things I did was this exercise in Oman, okay, safe Syria, yeah. in uh, two thousand and one. And of course, nine eleven happened while we were there and all that. Um, and it was really interesting just seeing, being at the start of seeing how the army, or how defence was going to change on. On, on those extraordinary events, completely unpredicted, yeah. um, and then really for the rest of my career, my rest of my career was was a reaction to, to all of that. Yeah. I remember going flying once, and we 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 had these Omani aviators, all of them really experienced instructors, and we decided we were going to do a multi ship, so Lynx, Gazelle, and Huey uh, formation, close formation flying, and. And I, and I was looking at this and I was thinking, yeah, this is right on the edge of my talent. Uh, you know, I don't have years and thousands of hours here, but as long as we brief this really, really well, have the parameters in there, rehearse it. And if you've ever seen an aircrew rehearse something, if you go, in, go into an airfield, go into a hangar, and you see these aircrew kind of wandering around in circles and kind of doing things, yeah. that's them literally rehearsing a flight. Sometimes you do it on bicycles. And we rehearsed it, briefed it, and the Omani instructors, as I say, super experienced, also super experienced at flying in deserts, right? Yeah. Which we were not super experienced at. They wanted us to fly to within one rotor span. So if you imagine the span yeah. of a rotor, that would be the gap between the two aircraft, right? Which is what, eight, eight meters? Somewhere? Something like that. Yeah, too quite close. close, close. Basically, Very too close, close right? Yeah. And I said, no. <laughs> and they said, yeah. okay, we'll authorize it to one, but we'll stay at two. And we're flying the sortie. And I thought, all right, okay, I'm comfortable now at two. I'm just going to see what one feels like. And I moved in to yeah. one, and I realised no one in my aircraft was breathing. Like nobody, the, no, there was nothing the happening. <laughs> everybody, everybody was at capacity, yeah. and I just moved right back out again. So uh, we don't need to ever do that again. Yeah. That that'll do. But that whole exercise was was a massive learning event. Yeah. Um, living in in the desert, austere conditions, engineering the aircraft, looking after yourself, looking after a team. Yeah. Uh, the team that I had, those that remained in the army beyond kind of five years, mm. almost all of them are Apache helicopter pilots now. Almost all of those are instructors, um, and that's a classic army thing. You put this young guy in front of a bunch of massive talent like that, say go and lead them. And you're like, okay, right, I've really got to think about how I'm going to lead these people. Every one of them better than me at my job. One of the things that happens kind of after that for, for a young officer is you you then. You, know, you have to do a job like you're the adjutant or the yeah. regimental operations officer, at which point you don't fly anymore. And suddenly the thing that really excited you is something you watch out of your office window <laughs> while other people do it, while you're doing big plans and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Then I got promoted, and then there's staff college, and, and, and then you've got this kind of distance between you and, and your passion now, and you've got to work out how to get back to it. And I got this staff job, and I worked for this guy, who was one of these great mentors and he didn't look upwards, he looked inwards at his team and he said to me, you're here for two years, I said yeah, two years and he went, I only want you to do one year because then I'm going to send you on operations (laughs) and I said okay, thank you for both of those, Um, I'll work out how to communicate that at home and I worked for him for a year and towards the end of that year the kind of big list comes out of roles on operations Yeah. and we looked at the list and there was a role working in General David Petraeus's headquarters in Baghdad in Iraq yeah. and it was a single person right? 
and it was it was one of these kind of slightly vaguely written roles so you know that whoever's doing it now is doing something that you might do but it'll probably change while you're there so you'll probably end up yeah. doing something completely different and I showed up to Baghdad which is a journey in itself and I got given to the American chief of intelligence and I said you work for him okay and everyone else in this this plans team they're all doing their roles nobody talked to each other about their, what their roles were or what they were what they were doing which is really good really important we were all friends and we had this kind of strange existence where I worked for this one guy and we spent a lot of time with the government of Iraq so there's a lot of out and about in Baghdad and around yeah. and around the country as well actually and what years what years approximately so, yes that was 2007 into 2008 yeah um it was quite busy in Iraq at that time. It was the height of the surge. If you remember, there's a thing called the surge where yeah. uh, I can't remember how many, 170 plus thousand American service people yeah. just in the country. Uh, and this surge capability, right, to get control of the insurgency. Yeah. And, and sometimes now, because it's a long time since that, that happened, and I retell this story sometimes, and, and I find it a bit odd now but it was so normal then is that I lived in a trailer in the back garden of Saddam's palace and surreal in itself that's surreal sure. in itself yeah. and the office space that we had sort of partitioned office space was in the north ballroom this massive marble ballroom in, in the palace and that thing could take a hit and it took a lot of hits I remember Easter 2008 nine day period we took 145 yeah. rockets and mortars into the compound in a nine day period and yeah there was a lot of destruction what did you find uh, the most difficult aspects of your time serving and uh, and we'll later come on to transition and other things so you can talk yeah. about that later but mainly about serving time what was the most difficult things you found so i think most people answer that question say leaving my family and going yeah um but if you if you joined the army for the things that I joined the army for, leaving your family is something you have to do necessarily to go and do those things. You sort of accept it. Uh, and, and I was raised in, in a family that you know, we, were, we were forever sort of without dad because he was at sea. Yeah. Um, and as a submarine, like, nobody knows where the submarine is. Yeah. Uh, indeed, at home, my parents have the signal. When my brother was born, my father was at sea. Uh, and, this, um, and it's a signal transmitted from the UK to all shipping in the North Atlantic, naming my father and the, my brother and his weight yeah. and all doing well and all that sort of stuff. And when the submarine comes up, trails its antenna and gets its signals, prints them off, and my father gets summoned to the captain's cabin to be shown his signal, well done, you're a father. <laughs> um, <laughs> these were normal stories for us growing up. So, so leaving home, was okay for me. I don't suppose it necessarily was for anyone left at home, but uh, I found that all right. Mm. I think the, the things that I found most challenging were mm. actually kind of big leadership challenges. And you know, we, we might talk about being at sea, but I took a team to sea for five weeks once, and we were proving a capability. And I had 87 people in my team two of which were in the Royal Navy, the other 85 were in the Army. They definitely joined the Army, they definitely did not join the Navy, and they've been at sea for five weeks, which for the Navy is zero time. For, 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 yeah. for 85 people that joined the Army, five weeks at sea is quite a long time at sea. But it's okay because we're going home next week. Mm. And I had to get the team together and say, you are not going home and I cannot tell you when you are going home and you're going to have a war instead. Yeah. And we're about to shut down all the communications from this ship, so you won't be able to tell your family. Someone else is going to go around the house and do that for you. And just kind of being, being in that position to go and tell people all your plans for the summer are over, there will be no holiday, you are not going home. You didn't join the navy, but you're in the navy for the foreseeable future, <laughs> and yeah. it's getting and it's going to get harder. So I got called out for that to fly over to this other ship, which I thought was for a planning session for this little exercise in Albania, and then go home. Yeah. And I got pulled into a secret compartment, 
and there were two people in there. One was an intelligence officer, and the other was 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 the guy mm-hmm. I took over the squadron from, so Army Air Corps. Yeah, and they, and I said, so this isn't about Albania then, and, and they said, no, 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 draws back the curtains, map of Libya, and so we have this quite serious conversation about yeah. where all the bad things are, where there were three distinct front lines in the country where the rebels and the, and the pro gaddafi forces were basically just locked in this stalemate. Yeah. And the Army Air Corps guy says, uh, I've ordered 150 Hellfire missiles, I've ordered 28,000 rounds of 30 mil, and then I can't remember the number of rockets, and another helicopter. Was that enough? Uh, it, it, it just. And you've got six days to reorganize, so we're off the coast of Cyprus at this point, to yeah. reorganize. We put together a couple of the training serials because it was a different way of flying to Afghanistan. Yeah. Afghanistan you fly high in the Apache you fly yeah. high and broadly it's out of the risk zone um, but Libya had absolutely every threat from yeah. ground to 11,000 feet there was yeah. nowhere you could go where something wasn't going to be able to get you Yeah. so we decided that low level was it and that required new clearances for the aircraft because flying yeah. that aircraft over the sea is, is a dangerous thing because if yeah. it goes into the sea you, you have a it, the, you have many problems immediately. It has yeah. the most pessimistic ditching characteristics of any aircraft that's ever been made. But the other thing is there's loads of bad stuff because we only ever flew at night, we only ever flew behind enemy lines, yeah. uh, and we only ever did it when there was a target set that we, yeah. that we were going to go to. So every time we were released to fly, we knew we were going to get shot at again. Was it safest at night? Is that the reasoning behind night time? Or, or were there heat issues? or? Mm. D- Night worked for us because we operate uh, an infrared video camera, yeah. which I'm sort of pointing at my right eye, but that's where it's, proje- it's projected yeah. into your right eye. Okay. And of course, over your right eye is also projected uh, a sort of dynamic head-up display, all the symbology, all the information that you'd ever need to know. So you never need to look inside. You never need to look at instruments. Yeah. All you need to do is look at, look out. Uh, and one of the first things you do when you get in, get in this aircraft is you synchronise your head to the aircraft or the aircraft to your head, I can't remember which way around it is, but there are sensors on your helmet and there are sensors in the cockpit, yeah. which now the aircraft knows where you're looking, so that camera will look where you, and same with the gun, guns. Uh, so I mean, the, the aircraft is built from first principles to, to find things and, and shoot them. Yeah. And if I tell you that you know, to, to fire a laser guided missile is about three switches, yeah. To change the radio frequency is about eleven. So you can see how <laughs> yeah, how this thing's been designed to, to Yeah. So yeah, so we've done all this sort of proving and now mm. it was time to you know, time to go. And everyone cancelled their holidays, everyone cancelled their summer and I, I said to I said to folks that at least two months, three months, you know, how long is a, how long does an air campaign last? Not not forever, but let's just say the whole summer. Let's say until the autumn and then and then we'll reassess as we go. Uh, and off we went. Off we went to Libya. We flew our first mission, and that was supposed to be a kind of easy, easy uh, one. Yeah. And it was the first half. It was definitely it's very easy to shoot a, a radar mast. What were you hiding behind in general? Is a lot. I take it mainly desert, but quite a lot of wood. Uh, there's no, hide, the no You just there's no hiding of anything. Right. But I remember getting shot at on that first mission. And, and it was an anti-aircraft artillery piece and it was yeah. really going for us. And you know, that was a bit of a new experience. Uh, and I remember just handed the target to my wingman who was perfectly lined up and, and he destroyed the target. And we flew back to the ship, landed, and, and then I had to give this interview because uh, we had Sky and ITV and all these uh, newspaper journalists and I had to, we did all the debrief and stuff. And then I had to go back on deck and give this interview to camera. And I remember talking about it and saying, yeah, we were shot at, but you know, didn't get hit. And, and that, needed, that needed to be important because everyone was worried about the risk of, of getting shot down. Yeah. And then I went to find my uh, colleagues that I'd been flying with that night. And then they had this cool little secret bar on seven deck, which is like way below the water line. <laughs> And I'd never been down there before. And I was it's like engineering. Like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> where is this secret bar? And I found my way to it. And so we had a few beers. And we were just watching telly. We were watching Sky News. And then, literally, there's us 
on Sky News taking off and flying. It was like, you know, four hours ago that happened. That was us four hours ago. And then you can see the flashes of light on the coast as we were, you know, servicing these toilets. Um, and that went on for, well, it did go on for two months, two and a half months. So tell me about the experiences post military. So transitioning from the military. Let's say the last couple of years as well, because I'm guessing like most months you might have been thinking about it and then ready to go. And then that transition of uh, resettlement and training and thoughts in your head and mm. how that went and what you did to get where you are yeah. to now. Yeah, okay. yeah uh, really good question. Uh, and, and everybody's got a decent transitioning story. Yeah. And they're all different. And lots of folks think it's just one journey, but it's not. It's an entirely individual one. Uh, I, I knew that I would leave the army when I joined, and that's really important because everybody needs to know that. And I watched my father leave the navy, you know, when I was at school, and 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 so it was all I always knew. And I needed to choose it rather than it choose me. And. So I made a plan. I'm a pretty methodical person. So I knew more than two years before I left that I was going to leave in, let's say, 24 months, 36 months. Yeah. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know this would be a good time for me to go. And what, what were you when you were thinking about it? What, uh, you were a CEO, a manager of X amount of people. Um, what's your position and what were you doing at uh, that was, time when you were thinking about it? Yeah, I was just about to take over command of a regiment. So, not an Apache regiment, which is about 480 people. Yeah. What I didn't want to do was get into beginning that transition journey while I was in that role. Uh, and that's really important because yeah. you've got to give yourself to that role. Yeah. That is a dedicated, a <laughs> yeah. is important. Yeah. And you do not want a distraction. And you don't want the people in your team to go, oh, yeah, the CEO is leaving, it's, you know, he's absent. Yeah. Uh, so I, I needed to give that role 100% of me until the day after I handed it over. But during that time, I was, I was able to do a lot of thinking. I was able to speak to people and, and formulate some ideas. And what I did was, I then gave myself an extra year after I handed over command to the regiment. And in order to do that, uh, I had to volunteer to go on another operational tour in the Middle East, again, in a big American headquarters, thinking big thoughts about how to handle the, the, the big problems in 2016 in Syria and Iraq. Yeah. And being away for that time also gave me lots of thinking time as well. Yeah. And I, I spoke to the people that were leading the Army Air Corps before I went and I, I wrote them a letter and I said, I'm not going to, don't run me to another board because I won't do it because I am going to leave. And you know, it's not you, it's me, it's been great. I've absolutely loved it, but it's my time to go. Yeah. Uh, I did some courses, you know, program management, risk management courses, yeah. which only gave me a language, I suppose, and I kind of formalized things that I already knew I was good at. Yeah. Uh, but it's useful to have those accreditations, um, particularly to speak the right language of program management and risk management. Yeah. Uh, although I do bits of that, actually, I'm a you know, technology delivery person today. And then when it came for my time to, to go, I was very deliberate about networking into the areas that I thought I'd be interested in. Yeah, and did that change? Then where you thought you'd be interested in and where you ended up? I thought professional services, as in consultancies. Yeah. Or the financial sector. Okay. And, and, I, had, and I ran two lines, you know, into, into each, yeah. each of those. And I was having really good conversations with all of those. And it's only, I've never applied for a job in my life, sorry. It's all networking. Yeah. And I networked my way to a lead, which turned into an opportunity, which turned into an interview, which turned into a role in a bank. And but the role was on in a digital transformation program, massive three year long thing, which I did three years of. Yeah. And while I was doing that, I, re I kind of recognised myself, it's not 
the financial sector necessarily, it's technology that I'm interested in. And I didn't know that before. Until you go that. Because no, nobody, you know, you leave the army at, in, you know, seven years ago. Yeah. Um, digital transformation was a bit of a cool new thing out there. Yeah. And you go, right, what have I done in the army that makes me relevant to a digital transformation project? Probably nothing. Yeah, okay, it, right, let's, let's try and speak to a consultancy or a bank, you know, try and get yeah. some sort of role. And it, it was just sheer coincidence that there was a role going in a, a technology program. And, and when that finished, and I left the bank, and I came to Net Company, I came to Net Company really deliberately because it's a technology delivery company. Yeah. Uh, might might be a consulting you know a consultancy yes but actually it's it's the technology it's the technology delivery that that we that we do and, and that I realise I'm really passionate about um, and you know I work on our defence account because I speak defence it kind of it all works, language, all makes yeah. sense now yeah whereas you know I was thinking I should be doing I should be you know following the footsteps of all these other people that I've seen you know, going to the financial yeah. sector or into the consultancies and just kind of doing that but actually no. It was, it's tech. And then you just need to find that out, right? You just need to find that out and you do it by experience. Yeah. And we, we have a service leaders program. Do so we hire right. people, you know, directly out of the military into the company? And, uh, and I, 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 I'm spending a lot of time in that interview process to, to, to select candidates. And there are so many directly relevant experiences and, and talent in service leavers into the digital economy. I interviewed a guy recently who, who basically, without using the technical language of, of digital deliveries, described to me the whole life cycle of a, of a digital program from, from thinking about it to delivering it. Yeah. And and he's never done one of those before. But he's, he it's a good start was, for the job. Yeah, it's a good start for the job. Did offer it. Yeah, he's, he's joining. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to hear the case study of that one in a year or two's time. Um, that's good. Mike, is, is there any other stories that are specific that come come to mind that are about um, pe- other people's transitions that maybe have through through working with the ERGs and all all this yeah. work, great work you're doing? Um, anything that comes to mind? Well, and, and and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a technology story. So oh. that, that's well, what that's what, that's what you for. get uh, when yeah. I come and speak to you. So I had a soldier in my squadron who joined the army age 16 yeah. with a handful of GCSEs, and uh, he did did all the work at sea that that, that I did. You know, so, like, so he went to Libya proper, with you, yeah, yeah, and east of Suez. After that, you know, did the full. The full tour, and he left the army age 22. And would he have lots of driving licenses for trucks and things like yeah. that? And he was a physical training instructor. Yeah. And and he he had, he got roles that kind of fitted that. So he's going to become a personal trainer or a driver from the back of those qualifications. On the back, you would, yeah. normally say, you would yeah. think. You would think. Yeah. Okay. And. And, and you know, this was quite a long time ago. This is, this is probably ten years ago yep. that, that, that this guy left. And and the pathways are different now. And the opportunities to recognise what you really want to do rather than what you think you can only do yep. are different now. You know, CTP is really good. Uh, you know, the, the opportunities to to spend time with someone to help you unpack your yep. uh, your, your thinking. And a bit of this story is don't follow what you think is obvious. Follow. Well, actually listen to a bit of your passion as well. Sounds like your own story in a certain it's way. It's not. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So he, he got a role driving a truck at an airfield yeah. in a country about 2,000 miles away from here. Yeah. And what he would do is drive out his, his fuel truck yeah. to the middle of the airfield, download YouTube videos on computer coding. And then on in his downtime, he self-taught himself how to code. Wow. And he just thought this was a hobby and it was interesting and, you know, he'd read yeah. a book and do a bit of coding and, and it was fun. But that guy's a software engineer now. Why would you say businesses sporting defence is important to you from your perspective? Yeah, so I, the, there needs to be a, a sort of continual narrative, a conversation. And from, from the one hand, the, the various sectors and businesses within that need to understand the MOD and need to understand the people that join the military 
what they do, what their lived experience is, and there are hugely different ones all the way through. Yeah. And, and I'd also include in that civil science as well, but, but let's just keep it to, to, yeah. to uniform serving people for, for this conversation. And for, for an organisation like the one I'm in or the one I used to be in to understand defence and what motivates people to join it, stay in it, eventually leave it, and what they take with them when they leave. I think that's why it's so important. Mm-hmm. And how do you do that, right? Yeah. How, you, you need bridges to do that. Yeah. You need kind of mechanisms to, to do that. You need forums in which to, to have that. DRM's a good one. You know, Armed Forces Covenant is a good one. And being able to being able to take those take those bridges and be able to listen to defence yeah. and listen to here here are the things that we do in defence and here's why we do them. Here are the here are the sorts of skills that that we are giving people in defence that you probably didn't know about. Uh, digital skills is a great one. I mean there's a big massive digital skills initiative that's just, just started in, in, in the MOD in the last month. Um, you know, one of the massive providers, Microsoft, I think, is, yep. is doing that, uh, and that's brilliant. But then also is is us being able to, as organisations, listen to defence to say, you know, what are what are the things that we can do better for you, and the things that we as organisations can can do better for for defence. I think you know are things like having having you know, really good engagement initiatives that that allow. Services, not just services, but actually veterans. So just, let's talk about the military community, yeah. which is everybody, dependents as well, not just people who've served, and not just services, not just you know, the military community. Understand the needs of the military community, the skills in the military community that yeah. are just not tapped. And I mean, we had a conversation about this uh, a couple of weeks ago at an event uh, where where we we, we talked about cultures within companies, being the right cultures that will attract your service lever. Um, and there's one for every company, I'm sure. Yeah, well yeah. there is, yeah. And just things like employee resource groups. Um, you know, we have a we have one in that company, Veterans One, NetVets UK. Um, and you know, we're reasonably small, but we're very noisy. Um, and and that is part of our Armed Forces Covenant journey is, is that group yeah. driving that. And and I'm I'm off to I'm off to see the Army Expo tomorrow actually at Wellington Barracks, which which is a bit of you know I you know I've got a place to go and see that, which is really good, and that is me going back to the army to understand it because seven years ago to today that's a different there's army, a change, that's yeah. a different army. So I think it's really important that I, I spend you know a couple of hours there tomorrow morning. It's part of the communication that. piece, I guess, mm-hmm. between industry and defence. Yeah, um, creating more of those sort of bridges as you call them, or pathways, whatever you want to call these things. That's great. So Mike, thank you so much for joining us today for Being Forces Friendly podcast. Um, I'm Ben Onions and this is Mike Neville from Net Company. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. You can find us on all your favourite podcasting platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor and on YouTube. Also, don't forget to follow DRM on social media. All of the links can be found in the episode bio.